Welcome back to Veteran Art Studio. I'm MB Delocchio, and today we're going to be talking about creating while marginalized. There are people out there who need your art, music, or any other creative works you produce. When you put your art out there and into the world, you are literally contributing to art history just by existing. If you belong to a marginalized community, you're not just creating for yourself anymore. You're creating space for other marginalized artists just by speaking with your authentic voice. When it comes to literary arts, visual arts, the music industry, and more, bigotry and obstructionism exist and can sometimes compound your experience as an artist, something in which I can certainly relate. Seats taken. There are so many marginalized people throughout the history of various art mediums who've attempted to go around unjust organizations and institutions by concealing their identities or essentially building their own table without support. This undoubtedly is far more difficult, but I would say that the most daring works of art come from a sense of isolation, channeling painful feelings, and then putting such emotion into a creative project. When I returned from Iraq in late 2005, my sense of joy in creating art practically dissipated, but I forced myself to paint, draw, and create despite hand tremors, insomnia, and night terrors. It wasn't until 2008 when I seriously started to write out my manuscript for Quixote and Ramadi and query literary agents as well as traditional and independent publishers. I prepared myself as best as I could by reading up on how to make a book proposal, a quality query letter, and more to position myself as a serious writer who was motivated to tell a story of trauma and surviving a horrific deployment. However, I was met with a series of no's and excuses as to why my manuscript couldn't be accepted. In 2013, after hearing the same lines from agents and publishers over and over about how the market wasn't ready for my book, or that the manuscript had too much profanity, an independent publisher got real with me. And I'm eternally grateful that he took the time to be open and frank about the path ahead. Essentially, this small publisher in the US Southwest stated that my book contained a powerful story, but it also challenged the ongoing narrative of justifying US-led wars around the world and what it's doing to civilians and war veterans alike. It also wasn't helping that an indigenous Pacific Islander was holding the pen as Veteran memoirs pushed by mainstream publishers are overwhelmingly white, with a few minorities who don't challenge imperialism are occasionally allowed through the gates. To me, this verified what I was feeling, yet I had felt alone in saying so. And this came from an older white male publisher who also happened to be a Vietnam veteran. He declined to publish my work out of fear of backlash, but encouraged me to never stop writing and to have the courage that one day my voice would be heard. While I wasn't thrilled with another no, even if it validated my sentiments over five years of literary rejections, I took this access denial as a gift. I self-published Quixote and Ramadi in 2013. A few traditionally published authors, all white women, who either wrote about their own military experience or the experiences of others, initially scoffed at my self-published book, saying, oh, that's too bad that you had to self-publish, laugh out loud. Sometimes you just have to wait your turn. Or, one day, people will be interested in what islanders have to say. Did you cringe a bit at any of those microaggressions? Because while that happened in 2013, all of those people are cringing much harder as DEI and intersectionality theory gain more steam. And they are now desperate to remain relevant despite their absolute shit behavior. Even if indigenous Pacific Islander voices are still absent from mainstream literature, I know how valuable my voice is based on the amounts of microaggressions and pushback I got from privileged authors who were handed every opportunity with book deals, professional marketing, sales support, and representation. If what I was saying wasn't important, they wouldn't have worked so hard to put me down and exclude me. While I didn't have any of those systems of support, I still got to speak with Representative Speer at the Commonwealth Club in San Francisco. And this wasn't because I asked to be there, but because her office requested my presence at her event after reading my self-published book. So don't allow negative people to deter you from speaking up about your narrative, because while you may not be everyone's cup of tea, the right people will come around for a sip. Later, as I started to write The Desert Warrior, 
I encountered similar rejections saying the usual. Your book is just not right for the market at this time. Maybe next year. Or, we don't need any more memoirs, unless you're famous. Or, we only publish military genre if you're a Navy SEAL with a peen. Whatever, I expected it. However, this time around, I got a literary agent from a major agency in New York that did publish the usual thank me for my service stories and reality show pick me marmoset dipshit memoirs. At first, my agent, we'll call her Jane, and I had wonderful phone chats and she really seemed to believe in my work. Yet this enthusiasm started to wane in the coming months when she pitched my memoir to all those We Need Diverse Books publishers who allegedly wanted underrepresented voices. They overwhelmingly hit back with some additionally disappointing, yet validating news. One publisher in New York confided in Jane that no one was going to publish a memoir like mine unless it was a blonde with blue eyes and a victim complex. Essentially, only white damsels in distress need apply. Once again, this was disappointing, but this commentary kept coming up with numerous publishers saying that no one would want to buy a book by a Micronesian because WTF is that, gasp, woman, who also happens to be a combat veteran, and that since there aren't any major Pacific Islander authors, there's no way to gauge my potential success via profit and loss forecasting. Therefore, it was a constant no to my manuscript. After a steady stream of whites-only microaggressions from publishers behind closed doors to my white hipster agent, many of these publishers are those you've probably heard of we decided to have another call to figure out a way forward. Jane suggested that I shorten my manuscript, which I did to about 280 pages, quite standard for a trade nonfiction book. She then suggested that I rearrange my chapters, make them shorter, then longer. Then she would jump around assigning task to task so much that I realized what she was doing. Much like the traditional publishers, she was moving the goalpost. Instead of advocating for my book, she was engaging in gaslighting. I then confronted her about it and she vehemently denied it, of course, see gaslighting. I gave her examples of books of similar lengths, chapters, and so on, from Hemingway to Winona LaDuke. I used various literary references to show where my manuscript structure really wasn't an outlier or a problem. I just wanted to know what her issue was. Don't compare yourself to famous authors and what they've done. Who are you to think that your work is special? She barked back over the phone. While I wasn't insisting that my work was worthy of a literary prize, it was that my manuscript length, or the amount of chapters, were no different from well-known books. However, what she said spoke volumes. It was her insisting that I should know my place, and that I didn't belong in literary spaces of privilege with social and financial capital. She was merely giving me lip service, humoring the one woman of color on her author list at the time, and I knew I deserved better. After this last conversation, I ended my contract with her and decided to go the self-publishing route again. This time, a few of the same wait-your-turn white women authors offered assistance. I accepted, only to be ignored and sidelined once again. Perhaps the empty offer was a way to assuage their guilt, but I expected it and it's always worth a shot. Since I was working full-time, I decided to take on an editor who could do both copy and content work with me to ensure my book was ready to publish. An Irish professor at the University of Nevada in Las Vegas named Sean assisted me in separating the wheat from the chaff, which got my book out onto the market. After all I have endured, I would have been remiss if I didn't ask him how he felt about the manuscript. After the line and word edits, which all felt quite normal and routine, what I was hoping for, an experience without the weird contempt or gaslighting, I asked if he could tell me what he thought the problem was with my work and why it elicited so many rejections. He wasn't American and could still give a perspective of privilege, yet with somewhat of an outsider lens. In the end, he provided an abundance of notes of his personal thoughts and insights, for which I was grateful to hear, because it confirmed how pain and trauma are, in fact, universal. He then said, thanks so much for letting me read your book. I really enjoyed it. That might sound like a strange thing to say given the content, but what I mean is that it is a fulfilling experience, and I think I learned a lot. He didn't have to provide this feedback, he was already paid, 
but he did confirm that from his experience instructing in an MFA program that my manuscript wasn't the problem. It's the industry that is filled with prejudice. Time and again, this sentiment has been validated. In short, it's not you who isn't important. It's the unnecessary bigotry that we're dealing with, which is bullshit. Art World Navigation When it comes to my journey with the art world, it was cumbersome, but I would argue that there are more ways to navigate around microaggressions and institutionalized discrimination. I found a lot more support among other marginalized visual artists than I did in the literary arts, and as a result, have been able to display my work in various independent galleries and public venues. Additionally, I have been more successful in selling work in my own online art shop, in addition to selling work from my virtual art exhibitions. Art is subjective in the way that it can be created by anyone, but even though I have experienced setbacks throughout my interactions with galleries and curators, I would still say that it has been a far more positive journey than with publishing. Art should be able to exist in any form or venue possible. It's for everyone. The fact that art can now exist in all parts of society means that artists are experiencing a wider range of opportunities than ever before through different genres, mediums, and venues. And yet somehow, we're still stuck with this outdated system where white men still reign supreme in the art world. While many institutions have allegedly attempted to diversify their curators and artists, the art world represents a community that is still deeply rooted in colonialist tradition the things that continue to oppress women and minority groups. In my case, I'm not someone who has been formally trained artistically from an institution or school. While I can proclaim to be an artist, I am at a disadvantage because not only do institutions want to promote their star students over everyone else, but art schools do not always reach marginalized people and instruct them on how they can engage with art for political activism or social change. The art world does very little in providing resources for emerging artists or collectives that are marginalized by race, class, gender, sexuality, disability, and so on. Art Activism Art can be used as a tool to express one's identity and social realities instead of being regarded as an apolitical form of self-expression. Art can change society. It does all the time through various mediums and genres. And yet so many art institutions continue to ignore its potential to enact change, especially within society by promoting only work that reinforces dominant narrative structures, but in catering to neoliberal consumer ideals without challenging power structures and the art market. Therefore, art activism is a way of expressing one's art in order to spark social change within society. Art activism can be used as a vehicle for social justice, and promoting a variety of issues that are essential to dismantling power structures because art will always be political. Art activism brings together marginalized communities so they can practice art themselves without having to rely on others to control their identities and how they're presented. Art doesn't solely belong to those who hold dominant social positions and capital. It belongs to everyone and should be accessible to everyone. Battling Institutionalized Bigotry Let's say you're an artist who wants to fight the broken system. You want to push back against that bigotry and marginalization. You want to find a way to break into an industry, but you might find that the primary decision makers who determine whether your career happens or not are people who not only don't understand your identity, but may not even really believe that an audience exists for your demographic. Or even worse, they don't want your art seen, heard, or experienced at all due to prejudice. When marginalized groups are not represented in, within halls of power from mainstream traditional publishing or art galleries and are denied the opportunities to have their stories told, it fundamentally undermines the purpose of what art is supposed to be. Art has always been about giving a voice to those who are unheard, about expressing emotions and experiences that may go unspoken in other settings and often about finding healing from pain or inspiring strength in difficult circumstances. Art can help us survive, it can help us heal, and it can give us hope. So when marginalized people are denied their space to breathe, when they are being subjected to erasure or being forced to relinquish control over how their identities and their stories are perceived, it's not just the market driving taste, 
is institutionalized and systemic discrimination. When marginalized artists are denied the opportunity to perform, share, or exhibit their work, we create a culture where folks feel compelled, either consciously or subconsciously, to dim their own shine. The art world does itself a major disservice not only to the marginalized community, but also the art industry itself. This doesn't mean that parts of various creative industries aren't inclusive or that certain organizations don't welcome people of all racial, ethnic, or gender identities and expressions. It just means that if artistic industries want to genuinely claim that art is for everyone, then they need to include those groups who have been historically excluded from traditional publishing, the art world, theater, the music industry, and every other creative avenue that allows for showcasing powerful self-expression. Be unapologetically you. Creating while marginalized is a difficult existence. Art is subjective. Art is personal. Art is for people to experience. Art, if it exists in the public eye, must be accessible for everyone who wishes to experience it. There are no boundaries when creating art, which is why I find it so fascinating that this is where society has set limits on us as individuals who create art because of our identities. Identity plays a huge role in the art we create and how we express our experiences through a variety of mediums. Art is a powerful tool of self-expression, especially for marginalized artists who do not have visibility within the established art world or other creative industries. Art itself demands space and authenticity. Marginalized artists often only have access to publicity and artistic spaces under specific terms with conditions set up by bureaucratic institutions led by privileged people who identify with dominant culture that sometimes further marginalize lived experiences rather than building them up. Creating while marginalized means pushing back against those boundaries and utilizing the limited spaces available as tools for visibility and resistance where possible. It takes courage because there are consequences for artists who push back against their respective industries. This process of pushing back can dehumanize us, make us feel less than, and bring up the worst parts of ourselves and allow for the generational trauma of our history to surface. Powerful narratives demand space and visibility, with or without the support of mainstream industry powerhouses because art will speak its truth without them. It cannot be silenced. Art is a way to build communities and platforms where there were none. And much of what we see is a continued struggle to articulate our own stories with hashtag own voices. Creating while marginalized is also compounded with the duty to uplift those voices around you as allies while building your own voice. It's exhausting. However, we can channel much of this frustration into powerful works of art that act as a beautiful piece of resistance that we should not take for granted. As marginalized artists, this is truly a gift in disguise because it truly takes bravery to create under systems that would rather see us silenced and disappeared. Marginalized art takes courage. Art is meant to uplift marginalized voices, no matter what anyone says about your existence. Art exists outside the boundaries of the social and financial capital around us, made up by the social constructs built on capitalism, dominant culture, and imperialist institutions. Those of us who don't fit within its colonial confines are actually free to do what we want. While many of us do not have access to capital to create without oppressive burdens, like cost, time, and space, don't let naysayers or lack of access to privileged spaces deter you. To this, I say, self-publish if you need to. Set up your own art shop or virtual exhibit. Create a short film you've always wanted to make using your phone. Write that play or TV script. Act as though you're always going to get a yes, no matter how many times you've heard no. And someone, somewhere, will fall in love with your work because you've invested time, passion, and energy into being authentically you despite the odds and obstacles. And that's a beautiful thing. I'm not gonna say it was easy to push aside demoralizing moments. All of those feelings are undoubtedly valid and real. You're going to get tired of fighting at various points in your life, and you'll need to reset and recharge from various negative situations. When you find yourself exhausted, do your best to give yourself a bit of self-compassion. 
At the end of the day, your struggle and sacrifice through your art can help make someone else's life that much easier and provide a relatable vision and voice when someone is feeling alone in the world. Just by striving to be your best and most creative self, others will be inspired to do it too. And as a community, we can lift one another up to greater and more creative levels than ever. Thank you once again for visiting Veteran Art Studio. And if you found this content to be helpful, be sure to like, share, and subscribe to stay up to date on the latest episodes. I wish you success and fulfillment on your creative journey, and I'll see you here next time in the studio.